John Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literary and cultural studies. In this installment, I'll be saying some things about Virginia Woolf's essay, A Room of One's Own. Virginia Woolf was born in 1882 in London, and she died in 1941. She was the daughter of Leslie Stephen, who was the editor of the Dictionary of National Biography. This is important because the essay itself has much to do with the history of important people in Great Britain and with the relative absence of women among the group. Being the daughter of an intellectual like Leslie Stephen, Virginia Woolf had encouragements toward learning that most women were not afforded in her time. Though she was mostly self-taught, she had tutors, and she spent some time in a ladies' program at the University of London. Still, it might be said that most of her learning came as a result of her access to her father's library. This essay, A Room of One's Own, was originally written to be presented to a group of women students at Cambridge University. And at the time, 1928, women had only been studying at Cambridge University for about the past 60 years. So these students were relative pioneers in the history of higher education for women. The essay has been widely hailed as a landmark of feminist activism and criticism. Wolfe was already a famous novelist. She was noted for her use of methods such as stream-of-consciousness writing, and also for the depth and nuance with which she represented her characters and the relationships among characters. I will return to these themes as we look at some passages from the essay, but I find the essay especially interesting as well for its hard-nosed analysis of the material conditions faced by women who sought to become educated and to write. Okay, to Virginia Woolf. We've gone from Beowulf to Virginia Woolf, and here we are. Virginia Woolf. Literature in English had not been taught in colleges and universities in the early modern era until the 19th century. Students, the male students of those universities, studied Greek and Latin, and they read literary texts in Greek and Latin, but the literary texts they read were incidental to the study of Greek and Latin, and not, uh, not as literature on its own terms. And literature in English wasn't studied. I think um, the attitude would have been, why do you need to teach literature in English? Anyone who's at the university can speak English and read and write English, what's to teach? They can read it and either enjoy it or not, as the reader pleases, and there's nothing to teach there. So the study of English literature, in fact, emerges in the context of the admission of women to higher education in the first place. And here, in 1928, Wolfe is being invited to Cambridge to speak to a group of women students, because she's a famous woman novelist. And the essay is an exploration of the material conditions that make writing possible, and how those conditions have been withheld from women. She begins by relating what will seem to be a very trivial incident. But as we will see, it's the kind of an incident that repeated over decades and generations and centuries has had enormous consequences. She was, she tells the students, sitting on the banks by the river at Cambridge, deep in thought about what she was going to write, what she was going to say. Suddenly, she had a thought that was so striking that it prompted her to get up and to start to walk. Unfortunately for her, she happened to stray absentmindedly onto the grass, and immediately she was confronted by a beetle, a sort of a security guard, who abruptly informed her that she should walk on the path and not on the grass. Here was Virginia Woolf, the honored, invited guest lecturer, being confronted and reprimanded by a lowly beetle, a man who felt no sense of obligation to defer to the famous novelist. He was a man, she was a woman. It was the disturbance of a mere moment, nothing to bother about, and yet she will return to the incident 
at the end of the essay, the accumulation and the repetition of such incidents has an effect, she will show us, on the situation of women and the subordination of women historically in our society. I'll read a few lines. Here I was sitting on the banks of a river a week or two ago in fine October weather, lost in thought. That caller I have spoken of, women and fiction, the need of coming to some conclusion on a subject that raises all sorts of prejudices and passions, bowed my head to the ground. That caller she's speaking of now is one that she will develop more fully in describing. It's a metaphorical caller, but it's a problem she will develop more fully in the second part. And we're going to skip over that today, but in it, she talks about going into the library, you may recall from the video, and searching all of the research on women. And what she finds is that everything written about women was written by men, written by men who had really no qualifications at all for writing about women's experience. They, they not only had no experience of being a woman, they seemed not to have even thought it necessary to talk to a woman, to interview a woman, to find out what women's experience was. They just wrote either from, from a theological authority or their own presumed authority uh, as a man. You know the term mansplaining? It wasn't invented yet, but it's a pretty good word. So she gets up, starts walking across the grass. It was thus I found myself walking with extreme rapidity across a glass plot. Instantly, a man's figure rose to intercept me. Nor did I at first understand that the gesticulations of a curious looking object in a cutaway coat and evening shirt were aimed at me. His face expressed horror and indignation. Instinct rather than reason came to my help. He was a beetle. I was a woman. This was the turf. There was the path. Only the fellows and scholars are allowed here. The gravel is the place for me. She's being put in her place by a beetle. She's a famous novelist, an upper middle class, highly educated, sophisticated woman. But the beetle, a man, has the institutional authority and the presumed social authority. He has the authority and the responsibility to guard this grass. Such thoughts were the work of a moment. As I regained the path, the arms of the beetle sank. His face assumed its usual repose. And though turf is better walking than gravel, no very great harm was done. How would you describe the process that she's characterizing here or narrating here? What's her attitude? without being told to stay off the grass. I'm sorry? Don't want, to start a conversation. don't want to start a confrontation. We can understand why she doesn't say, don't you understand? I'm the famous novelist. But she doesn't. The consequence of her not doing it, and the consequence, I think she's implying, of women not doing it again and again, day after day, year after year, is that it repeats the taken for granted assumption that any man has authority over any woman, notwithstanding questions of merit or class privilege or anything like that. And she writes this, I think, with a good deal of subtlety and grace in a way that I hope encourages you to, to think deeply about it. So she walks along and she starts thinking about all the writers, all the male writers, who have studied at Cambridge and have walked these very paths that she's walking now. And so she starts thinking of John Milton. And you may recall, Milton also was a student at Cambridge. And then she thinks of Charles Lamb, the English essayist. And who knows why, some random thought comes into her head. And she recalls that Charles Lamb wrote an essay in which he couldn't imagine that Milton could have crossed out a line or crossed out a word in his famous poem, Lycidas, which was an elegy on the Cambridge 
undergraduate student, Edward King. That poem seemed so perfect to Charles Lamb, he couldn't imagine that Milton would have crossed out lines and reworked it, and that there could have been something wrong with it that needed to be corrected. And so she wonders to herself what words Milton had crossed out that so alarmed Charles Lamb. Or since Charles Lamb raised the issue, she just begins to wonder what line was crossed out. This, by the way, is stream of consciousness writing. Notice how this is organized, but it doesn't seem organized. She doesn't exactly say, well, I, I was walking, I was thinking, then I was walking on the grass, and then I got angry at the beetle, and now I'm going to tell you about it. Instead, she gives you her thoughts kind of the way we might think them as we're trying to think about what to write in our essay and we get distracted and one thing leads to another and pretty soon we're wondering which words Milton crossed out in his famous poem, Lycidas. And that's where she is, right? Now, it just so happens that the manuscript of Milton's poem, Lycidas, is in one of the libraries at Cambridge. And she happens to be at Cambridge. There's the library. Milton's papers are there. It then occurred to me that the very manuscript itself, which Lamb had looked at, was only a few hundred yards away, so that one could follow Lamb's footsteps across the quadrangle, presumably she'll walk on the gravel and not on the grass, to that famous library where the treasure is kept. Moreover, I recollected as I put this plan into execution, it is in this famous library that the manuscript of Thackeray's Esmond is also preserved. The critics often say that Esmond is Thackeray's most perfect novel. Is it the case that Thackeray's most perfect novel may have corrections in the manuscript? In which case, how did it become to be, did, it, did perfection not just happen, or was it a, a work of process? You see how her stream of consciousness is working. First Lamb, then Milton, then Thackeray, then perfection, crossing out words in an essay. But anyway, she's thinking these things, and so she walks toward the library. And so she's deep in this thought. One thing leads to another, stream of consciousness, which, oh, wait, Here's the door. But here I was actually at the door, which leads into the library itself. I must have opened it, for instantly there issued, like a guardian angel barring the way with a flutter of black gown instead of white wings. This angel is black, not white, a deprecating, silvery, kindly gentleman, who regretted in a low voice as he waved me back that ladies are only admitted to the library if accompanied by a fellow of the college or furnished with a letter of introduction. So she's chased away from the library too. She's getting no respect at Cambridge. But she goes to the luncheon. The food is not so good. Remember this, plain soup. The soup is so thin that you could read the pattern on the plate. That is, if the plate had a pattern, but this china is so plain that it doesn't have any design on the, on the plate even. And she reflects why the food at the men's colleges is so much better, and the china is better. Note the similarities of the highlighted text here to the idealization of Conrad's Kurtz that uh, we just read um, last week. This is what might be like, it might be like, for the men at the college, the young men at the college, the male students. Not like this for the female students. They have to be grateful just for being there. But if only Mrs. Seaton and her mother and her mother before her had learnt the great art of making money and had left their money, like their fathers and their grandfathers before them, to found fellowships and lectureships and prizes and scholarships appropriated to the use of their own sex, that is, the female sex. We might have dined very tolerably up here alone off a bird and a bottle of wine. We might have looked forward without undue confidence to a pleasant and honorable lifetime spent in the shelter of one of the liberally endowed professions. These men, they, they go to prep school, they, they go to the so-called British public school, which is really a private school, and then they they get uh, tutored, and then they go to Oxford or Cambridge, and then they enter the law or finance, 
They just drift through life with everything laid out for them. Not so for the women, because our mothers and our grandmothers didn't make a lot of money and donate it to universities for our benefit, unlike the men. What were they thinking? If that were the case, we might have been exploring or writing, mooning about the venerable places of the earth, sitting contemplative on the steps of the Parthenon, or going at 10 to an office and coming home comfortably at half past four to write a little poetry. This is the life of those captains of finance and the law and politics. Wolf concludes then that if their grandmothers had made more money, there would, there would have been no future generations, no men or women. Only if Mrs. Seaton and her like had gone into business at the age of 15, there would have been, ah, there's the rub, that was the snag in the argument, no Mary, and also no William either, right? What I asked, did Mary think of that? There between the curtains was the October night, calm and lovely, with a star or two caught in the yellowing trees. Was she ready to resign her share of it and her memories? If they had been a happy family, though a large one, of games and quarrels up in Scotland, which she is never tired of praising for the fineness of its air and the quality of its cakes, in order that Farnham might have been endowed with 50,000 pounds or so by a stroke of the pen. This is how it's done for the men's colleges. And it's only in the last 48 years that Mrs. Seaton has had a penny of her own in England. That is, only at this time, in the last 48 years, that it was legal in England for a woman to have her own bank account without the permission of her husband, for a woman to own her own property. For all the centuries before that, it would have been her husband's property, a thought of which perhaps may have had its share in keeping Mrs. Seaton and her mothers off the stock exchange. Pretty good disincentive for not making money if all the money you make is going to be your husband's property. Every penny I earn, they may have said, will be taken from me and disposed of according to my husband's wisdom. Perhaps to found a scholarship or to endow a fellowship in Balliol or King's College. So that to earn money, even if I could earn money, is not a matter that interests me very greatly. I'd better leave it to my husband. So then we get into this section that's most famous about Shakespeare's sister. So she's in the library and she has just gone through a litany of these male writers describing why women couldn't write. Be that as it may, I could not help thinking as I looked at the works of Shakespeare on the shelf that the bishop was right at least in this. It would have been impossible completely and entirely for any woman to have written the plays of Shakespeare in the age of Shakespeare. Let me imagine, since facts are so hard to come by, what would have happened had Shakespeare had a wonderfully gifted sister called Judith, let us say. Well, she says, Shakespeare himself went, very probably, to a grammar school where he may have learned Latin, Ovid, Virgil, and Horace, and the elements of grammar and logic. He was, Shakespeare was, it is well known, a wild boy who poached rabbits, perhaps shot a deer. Shakespeare's famously was taken into court as a teenager for killing a deer that belonged to an aristocrat. And had rather sooner than he should have done to marry a woman in the neighborhood who bore him a child rather quicker than was right. There's an old saying in the Ozarks where I grew up, for common folk wisdom, <clears throat> that generally it takes nine months after uh, a sexual encounter for a child to be born. Uh, term of a pregnancy is about nine months, except for the first one. The first one can happen any time. You know. Two months, three months, the first one is a, an, an exception. So Shakespeare had one of those. Uh, he, he, uh, he got married and pretty soon after uh, they had their first child, one of those early ones. And his wife was a bit older than he was. That's, that's also another matter. That escapade sent him to seek his fortune in London. Wolf Ryan, he had, it seemed, a taste for the theater. 
Perhaps he began by holding horses at the stage door. Very soon he got work in the theater, became a successful actor, and lived at the hub of the universe, meeting everybody, knowing everybody, practicing his art on the boards, on the stage, exercising his wits in the streets, and even getting access to the palace of the queen. Shakespeare's company acted before Queen Elizabeth. Special performances. So Shakespeare, it is imagined, led a charmed life, getting into trouble, then getting several second chances. But if he had a sister called Judith, perhaps, Judith Shakespeare's life would have been much more narrowly constrained. Wolf writes, meanwhile, his extraordinarily gifted sister, let us suppose, remained at home. She was as adventurous, as imaginative, as agog to see the world as he was, but she was not sent to school. She had no chance of learning grammar and logic, let alone of reading Horace and Virgil. She picked up a book now and then, one of her brothers perhaps, and read a few pages. But then her parents came in and told her to mend the stockings or mind the stew and not moon about with books and papers. They would have spoken sharply but kindly, for they were substantial people who knew the conditions of life for a woman and loved their daughter. More likely than not, she was the apple of her father's eye. A parent can truly love a child and yet not act in one's best interest. Believing that one is acting in the best interest of one's child, but um, you can't know everything. You can't know the best situation for your child, and you can't always predict the future. You can't always imagine that the future your child will encounter <clears throat> will have the same conditions that you encountered when you were the child's age. Perhaps she scribbled some pages up in the apple loft on the sly, but was careful to hide them or set fire to them. Soon, however, before she was out of her teens, she was to be betrothed to the son of a neighboring wool stapler. She cried out that marriage was hateful to her. Juliet, right, when her mother says, it's time for you to be married, what does Juliet say? It is an honor I had thought not on. She cried out that marriage was hateful to her, and for that she was severely beaten by her father. Then he ceased to scold her. He begged her instead not to hurt him, not to hurt his feelings, not to shame him in this matter of marriage. He would give her a chain of beads or a fine petticoat, he said, and there were tears in his eyes. He was sincere. How could she disobey him? How could she break his heart? So then Wolf imagines Judith, the fictional imaginary sister of Shakespeare, running away to London. What if she did that? And note the invited comparison to what happened to Will in London, parallel to her brother's experience. The force of her own gift alone drove her to it. She made up a small parcel of her belongings, let herself down by a rope one summer's night, and took the road to London. She was not 17. The birds that sang in the hedge were not more musical than she was. She had the quickest fancy, a gift like her brother's for the tune of words, like him, she had a taste for the theater. She stood at the stage door. She wanted to act, she said. Men laughed in her face. The manager, a fat, loose-lipped man, guffawed. He bellowed something about poodles dancing and women acting. No woman, he said, could possibly be an actress. He hinted, he hinted something. You can imagine what, what he would do with her, perhaps. The great irony here is the assumption that a teenage boy uh, can play a woman on a stage, and it's natural and realistic and uh, taken as self-evident, but a, a girl uh, would, would seem preposterous. A girl acting the part of a woman or a girl? Who ever heard of such a thing? So that would be the case of Judith, that she goes on. She could get no training in her craft. Could she even seek her dinner in a tavern or roam the streets at midnight? 
If she did, she would soon be taken for a prostitute. Yet her genius was for fiction and lusted to feed abundantly upon the lives of men and women in the study of their ways. At last, for she was very young, oddly like Shakespeare the poet in her face, with the same gray eyes and rounded brows, at last, Nick Green, the actor manager, took pity on her. She found herself with child by that gentleman, and so, who shall measure the heat and violence of the poet's heart when caught and tangled in a woman's body? She killed herself one winter's night and lies buried at some crossroads where the omnibuses now stop, outside the Elephant and Castle. That more or less, she says, is how the story would run, I think, if a woman in Shakespeare's day had had Shakespeare's genius. But genius like Shakespeare's, surely women must have had. Genius is not solely the, the possession of rich white men. Genius like Shakespeare's is not born among laboring, uneducated, servile people, it is said. It was not born among the Saxons and the Britons. It is not born today among the working classes, they say. But how then could it have been born among women whose work began almost before they were out of the nursery, who were forced to it by their parents and held to it by all the power of law and custom? Yet genius of a sort must have existed among women as it must have existed among the working class. Now and again, an Emily Bronte or a Robbie Burns blazes out and proves its presence. But certainly it never got itself onto the paper in Shakespeare's day. When, however, one reads of a witch being ducked, of a woman possessed by devils, of a wise woman selling herbs, or even of a very remarkable man who had a mother, then I think we are on the track of a lost novelist a suppressed poet of some mute and inglorious Jane Austen, some Emily Bronte who dashed her brains out on the moor or mopped and mowed about the highways, crazed with the torture that her gift had put her to. There must have been women like that. They were simply suppressed by the conventions. And not just the conventions, by the material conditions, not just the attitudes, by the daily grind of constantly having to deal with the disrespect of someone like that beetle or someone like that gentleman at the door of the library, of your own parents, your own peers, everyone constantly taking for granted that you're not meant for a life of note. For women, I thought, she writes, looking at the empty shelves, these difficulties were infinitely more formidable. Very few books were written by women in the library. In the first place, to have a room of her own, let alone a quiet room or a soundproof room, was out of the question for a woman at this time. Unless her parents were exceptionally rich or very noble, even up to the beginning of the 19th century, this would be the case. Since her pen money, her, her pocket money, her incidental money, which depended on the goodwill of her father, was only enough to keep her clothed, she was debarred from such alleviations as came even to Keats or Tennyson or Carlyle, all poor men, from a walking tour, a little journey to France, from the separate lodging which, even if it were miserable enough, sheltered them from the claims and tyrannies of their families. These men could have a little life of their own, even if they didn't have a fancy apartment, a fancy lodging. They had independence. The material conditions and means of independence, even if they were poor, as some of the writers were. Such material difficulties were formidable, but much worse than the material difficulties faced by women were the immaterial difficulties. Those are the ones that I was speaking of. The assumptions of everyone. The assumptions and the uh, sense that women would take as their own 
from long exposure to them. So she picks out a book by Mr. Oscar Browning, who's written his opinions about female students. Wolf says, I will quote Mr. Oscar Browning because Mr. Oscar Browning was a great figure in Cambridge at one time and used to examine the students at Girton College and at Nuna. Mr. Oscar Browning was wont to declare, quote, that the impression left on his mind after looking over any set of examination papers was that, irrespective of the marks he might give, the best woman was intellectually the inferior of the worst man. He can tell you that even before he reads the papers. He just knows it to be true because he's read so many papers. He always finds that it's borne out. And she gives other examples of this kind. Now she compares the situation of George Eliot to that of Tolstoy. Has anyone read Middlemarch or Silas Marner? George Eliot's couple. There's an old joke in, uh, among English literature professors that the canon of British literature, at least in the old days, um, contained 26 men and two and a half women. Uh, the 26 men along with Jane Austen, Emily Bronte, and George Eliot who was a woman but had to use the pen name of a man in order to get her work published. We can add Wolf to that now and a few others, but, it, but it's still a, lo a, lopsided, a lopsided canon in the favor of men. Wolf says, one of them, one of the women writers, it is true, George Eliot escaped after much tribulation, but only to a secluded villa at St. John's Wood. There she settled down in the shadow of the world's disapproval. I wish it to be understood, she wrote, that I should never invite anyone to come and see me who did not ask for the invitation. She was that much ostracized, that completely ostracized by her society because she was an independent woman. And she lived with a man who was married but left his wife. She was independent, but she paid a steep price for her independence in that society. And uh, <clears throat> she just proclaims, don't worry. If you're worried that I will invite you to come for a visit and you'll have to turn me down because it would be disgraceful for you to be seen with me or associate with me. If you want to come and visit me, ask me to invite you and then I will invite you. Otherwise, uh, don't worry. I won't embarrass you by inviting you, putting you in the position of having to turn down the invitation of the famous novelist because she seems a little bit immoral. Was she not living in sin with a married man and might not the sight of her damage the chastity of Mrs. Smith or whoever it might be the chance to call? One must submit to the social convention and be cut off from what is called the world. At the same time, on the other side of Europe, there was a young man living freely with this gypsy or with that great lady, going to the wars, picking up unhindered and censored all the varied experience of human life, which served him so splendidly later when he came to write his books. Who was that? Lev Tolstoy, the great Christian writer. Had Tolstoy lived at the Priory in seclusion with a married lady cut off from what is called the world, however, edifying the moral lesson, he could scarcely, I thought, have written War and Peace. It takes some experience of the world to be a great novelist. You have these geniuses in music and mathematics you don't have the same kind of geniuses, same kind of prodigies in literature. There are no nine or 10 year old novelists in the same way that Mozart could compose at that age. Because it takes experience to gather the materials, experience of life to gather the materials to write. So Tolstoy was such a man. Nothing that was human was alien to Tolstoy. That's what's available to men, not available to women in Shakespeare's time, still not available completely to women in Wolf's time and even in our time. So here's her conclusion. Genius, yes. A great writer needs genius. 
needs talent. But genius needs to eat in order to live. And she writes, here then, Mary Beaton ceases to speak. She has told you how she reached the conclusion, the prosaic conclusion that it is necessary to have 500 a year in a room with a lock on the door if you are to write fiction or poetry. Women haven't written as much as men because they haven't had the material conditions that would make it possible. She has tried to lay bare the thoughts and impressions that led her to think this. She has asked you to follow her flying into the arms of a beetle, lunching here, dining there, drawing pictures in the British Museum, taking books from the shelf, looking out of the window. While she has been doing all these things, you no doubt have been observing her failings and foibles and deciding what effect they have had on her opinions. You have been contradicting her and making whatever additions and deductions seem good to you. That is all as it should be. She's acknowledging the stream of consciousness experience of her audience as she is speaking to them in the speech. No doubt this experience as it is described may, may ring familiar to some of you, um, even in occasions like this present one. That's all good and as it should be for a question like this. Truth, remember truth. We began with truth. She suggested that maybe fiction will get at a deeper truth than the facts will. That is all as it should be, for in a question like this, the truth is only to be had by laying together many varieties of error. And I will end now in my own person by anticipating two criticisms so obvious that you can hardly fail to make them. No opinion has been expressed in this speech, you may say upon the comparative merits of the sexes, even as writers. That was done purposely because even if the time had come for such evaluation, and it is far more important at the moment to know how much money women had and how many rooms than to theorize about their capacities, even if the time had come, I do not believe that gifts, whether of mind or character, can be weighed like sugar and butter. Not even in Cambridge, where they are so adept at putting people into classes and fixing caps on their heads and letters after their name. I do not believe that even the table of precedency, which you will find in Whitaker's Almanac, represents a final order of values, or that there is any sound reason to suppose that a commander of the bath will ultimately walk into dinner behind a master in lunacy. A commander of the bath is a title bequeathed by uh, British royalty to aristocrats who have a special honor. And a master in lunacy is uh, a title that, that um, Wolf has made up for the occasion, but it, it seems to her to fit. All this pitting of sex against sex, of quality against quality, all this claiming of superiority and imputing of inferiority belong to the private school stage of human existence where there are sides, and it is necessary for one side to beat another side, and of the utmost importance to walk up to a platform and receive from the hands of the headmaster himself a highly ornamented pot. As people mature, they cease to believe in sides or in headmasters or in highly ornamented pots. At any rate, where books are concerned, it is notoriously difficult to fix labels of merit in such a way that they do not come off. Are not reviews of current literature a perpetual illustration of the difficulty of judgment? This great book, this worthless book, the same book is called by both names. Praise and blame alike mean nothing. There's more to it than that. So that's where she ends. Women's fiction may be quite different from that written by men, or may not. It's juvenile. This is high school stuff to try to sort out and proclaim that this writer is great, that writer is worthless. What's the point? So much better it would be to read women writers and male writers alike 
and recognize their benefits as they may be different without putting one down to raise the other up. And that's really what it is. One can only have a superior by identifying an inferior and making the superior then depend upon the rejection of the inferior. That's the way the patriarchal hierarchy has worked and still works. It's a good place to end for the moment today. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But, as always, if you have questions or comments, please don't hesitate to send me an email.